indeed. Oh, sorry, yeah. And we're recording. Okay, it's uh, tonight's talk is by Dr. Dave Holwell from Leicester University about the copper belt in Zambia. Dave is somebody who did his PhD at Cardiff University um, and while there also worked with SRK Exploration Services, which is where I first met him. Um, he's a very experienced field geologist, has some very unique ways of teaching his students and has, um, has basically been involved with the Copper Belt, the Bush Belt, and quite a large number of well-known ore deposits around the world. So over to you, Dave. Well, thank, thanks very much, Mark. Thanks for the invite and uh, happy to be here. I'm not actually in Leicester uh, today. I'm, I'm in North Wales uh, filming some uh, content for a virtual field trip for our students. We usually take them here. Um, but obviously can't at the moment, so um, they, they're going to get they, they're going to get some uh, videos and uh, footage from there. So that's where I am um, at the moment. Okay, so talk I'm going to give today is uh, on the Katumba uh, deposit in Zambia. Um, so this is actually an iron oxide copper gold. Uh, deposit, uh, but one that's been uh, super gene enriched. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about the way that we've applied automated quantitative mineralogy, AQM, uh, to assess this high grade oxidized super gene ore body. Okay. Um, so this was done as a University of Leicester project primarily through a master's research project by um, a student who I'll, I'll introduce you to in a moment, uh, with our partners Consolidated Mining and Investment, uh, their Zambian um, subsidiary Vulcan Copper, and also Zeiss, which is where the, the technology for the, the SEM mineralogy comes from. So here's the team. So uh, Kate in the middle there, Kate Cannon, uh, she was the master's student who um, did most of this work that I'm presenting. Uh, the paper for this is currently submitted to Mineralium Deposit, so waiting on the reviews for that. Uh, Ramana Khan um, works at Zeiss, um, so uh, uh, that was the, the partnership with the, uh, the technology at Zeiss. Ramana is actually ex Leicester. Uh, Daryl Blanks um, is a Leicester um, researcher, and the folks from Consolidated Mines and Investment who uh, currently own the license for, for Katumba. Uh, Simon Perkis, um, Craig Bailey are there, and uh, Emma Parker and others. Now, before I get into um, before I get into to, to the details of Katumba at first, I thought I might give you a little background in iron oxide copper gold deposits because, um, in case you, you aren't quite familiar with this, but it gives gives a little bit of context. So. And um, these are major sources of copper and gold. Um, so in that way, they're a little bit like porphyry deposits because they have similar sorts of grades um, of copper uh, and gold with similar um, uh, mineralogy, chalcopyrite, pyrite uh, and gold. But there are a lot of bi and co-products to IOCGs. Um, some of them you might... Uh, uh, recognize, I guess the biggest one here is Olympic Dam, uh, which not only is a copper deposit, it's one of the world, it's the world's biggest uranium deposit um, as well. Uh, masses amount of uh, silver in there as well. Other big ones um, in the Mount Isa in Lyre, Clon Curry District, we've got Ernest Henry, um, Bayan Obo there. Um, coming across, um, we've got the Southeast Missouri province, the Carajas province, including Salobo um, in Brazil, uh, Gelb Magrain, which is a first quantum operation in Mauritania. Uh, and they're well distributed, as you can see. Palabora sometimes gets um, put in with IOCGs. Um, but the one that we're looking at uh, today is in the Lufilian Arc um, in the Mumbwa region. Uh, in Zambia, not far from uh, the copper belt, which of course is host to lots of sediment hosted copper, but this is a slightly different style. Um, so you can get these IOCGs in a, in a range of settings. The ones in South America, let me, let me just say, 
there are some there which are we think related to the porphyries sort of a, a distal uh, expression of the same sort of magmatic hydrothermal regimes uh, but most of the iocgs like um, olympic dam etc um, are formed um, in protozoic um, settings um, and there are a broad diversity in deposit styles so they're quite difficult to to characterize like a magmatic sulfide deposit which is what i work on most of the time is quite in, in some ways quite simple the iocgs are quite varied but there are some things that we can say they are generally structurally controlled so either a shear zones breaches basically areas where you have pressure drop fluid mixing deposition of, of minerals um, you've got large um, pre or alteration footprints, which you can use as exploration vectors. And you have a pyrite chalcopyrite iron oxide assemblage. And weirdly, or unusually, for hydrothermal deposits, um, there's very little quartz in these. You usually have fluorite, barite, or carbonate as the GAN. And typically, most of them sit around here at around about 1% copper and about half a gram per tonne gold. So most of the big ones in there, uh, the Precambrian ones, there's a few um, uh, outliers here, which are either more gold rich and not much copper. So it's like, well, is that really a iron oxide copper gold deposit if it doesn't have any copper in it? Um, and these ones down here, which don't really have any gold in, but uh, these ones here, Ernest Henry, Olympic Dam, and uh, there's some in India, and the Zambian ones are in there too. Um, they have broad scale regional alteration, usually widespread sodic calcic alteration, and then a more localized potassic iron alteration stage, and then the ores. So you, you, you're zoning in um, on sort of three main stages of alteration uh, or ore styles. So that's, that's useful in exploration targeting. But once you get to the ore deposits themselves, they are very variable. So the pictures on the right there show four deposits from the same district in the Cloncurry region of Queensland, Australia. And they look very different. You wouldn't necessarily look at those and say they're all to part of the same deposit style. Um, but the broad diversity is a function of there are lots of different potential fluid sources. They could be magmatic, metamorphic, basinal, and they mix. You need the mixing of multiple fluid sources. Um, different fluid pathways allow those fluids to um, leach different elements along the way. Um, the host rocks are different. They can, they can be hosted by any rocks. It's mainly the structural control that is the important thing. So exploration is quite challenging because of the variety of these deposits. Uh, we've got those early um, uh, alteration stages that we can look at and those structural corridors, but it's then pinpointing them down. And the map there, this is a magnetic map of the Cloncurry region in Queensland. And the brighter colours here are um, high responses to the magnetic. So they've had magnetite alteration and the main deposits are sat within those. So they, you can use that as targeting, but the deposits will, will only be a small percentage of those high magnetic targets. So generally, we're looking at protozoic terrains. Uh, they are related to magmatism, but not necessarily associated spatially with those uh, intrusions. We've got major structural corridors and lots of early geochemical signatures from the alteration. And magnetite is quite useful. So let's go to Zambia now and have a look at the Katumba deposit. So uh, here's a map of part of Zambia and uh, into the DRC. This is the Lufilian Arc. Okay, so this is where all the copper belt deposits are in Zambia, uh, around Kitwe, uh, around here, up towards Solwezi. Um, and then into the DRC, we've got a belt of deposits um, which come through here. So the Lufilian Arc is one of the, uh, the world's greatest uh, sediment hosted copper cobalt districts. And um, the IOCGs in the area are just sort of to the south, but they're still within Lufilian 
Park and uh, Katanga uh, sediments, and they're related to the emplacement of this hook granite. Okay, uh, for those of you who know uh, Zambia, the capital Lusaka uh, is down here. This is the Kariba Dam down into Zimbabwe there. So geological setting around about 880, uh, 860, you start uh, rifting. Um, uh, the Zambezi belt down here and also uh, the Katangan basin uh, up here. Both of those basins opening up at the same time. Um, and they fill with a, a sequence of, of, of carbonate and siliciclastic and evaporitic sediments, there's magmatism. But then the closure and inversion of those basins at around about 550 during the Pan-African orogeny, uh, that in places this big hook granite and also some late stage cyanites and they're the ones of interest in this case. So zooming in on this hook granite uh, in the central part of Zambia, uh, for those of you who know Zambia, um, Lusaka is out um, to the to the east here, this is the Kafui Flats, so the hook batholith, you can see the scale there, this is hundreds of kilometers or a couple of hundred kilometers by about 100 kilometers um, but then around it in orange here are some late stage cyanides so a bit more of an alkaline flavor to the magmatism and there are copper deposits related to those but interestingly as well they are um, intruded into these blue units which are Katangan supergroup sediments which are the same host rocks to the vast sediment hosted copper deposits of the copper belt um, so if we're going to focus up in this district, so we've got the town of Mumbwa there and then these cyanites to the northwest of Mumbwa. And this one up here I'll mention uh, as well. Uh, because, here's a little, little fact for you, uh, Zambia's first producing copper mine was not actually in the copper belt, it was here in the Mumbwa district and it was the Hippo mine. Um, and you can go visit the Hippo mine now, here it is, obviously not, not operating anymore. Um, but it's in the Kafui National Park. The Kafui River runs through here. So there's a, very, a couple of nice lodges just nearby, including one called Hippo Lodge, uh, which you can stay at, have a, have a little sunset cruise, gin and tonic, um, and then a game drive in the morning, which will take in uh, the old Hippo Mine. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, and when we went to the Hippo Mine, uh, here's some nice green and blue uh, copper minerals, some. Um, yellow fluorite there and the wildlife has taken over so this is a uh, a leopard that we saw actually in the hippo mine when we when we visited that so zooming in a little bit on the geological setting so uh, there's the hook granite um, hippos out there into uh, the katumba district there are a number of these cyanites here in in pink these are about 550 to 540, uh, that's the hook granite. The IOCGs are a little bit later, 520-ish, that's the, so these late stage cyanides. And they are controlled, IOCG deposits are always controlled by faults. So there's a big north-south trending Katumb fault system which has um, the deposit in. So they're related to fluids coming off the hook granite and these cyanites probably mixing with some basement fluids um, as well. And here's a cross section um, through the ore body. We've got a, that fault zone here. Um, and the ore body sits just adjacent to that fault zone. So the, the, that's the structural control. That's probably where the fluids are moving up. Um, but the thing about Katumbra is it's not just an IOCG deposit. It's one that has been super gene enriched. So it has a, a thick oxidized blanket which has upgraded uh, the the copper grades to a sort of percentage of, I mean we've got there 235 meters at 2.2 percent copper so um, these are pretty high grades um, over those those intersections. So a little bit of little bit of history uh, late 19th century mining started in the area uh, hippo and sable antelope uh, and in, in the, the early parts of the 20th century, um, there were discoveries in this part of Zambia, which was referred to as the Big Concession. Um, that included a few, few deposits, Silver King, Sugarloaf, Lulu, Kamiyobo, 
Um, but then about a century later, uh, BHP and Blackthorne identified a number of prospects using geophysics. And in 2014, Blackthorne um, was granted a license um, after a merger with Intrepid. Um, and they did find a resource at 29 million tonnes at 2.2 copper. Uh, the license has since been taken up by Consolidated Mines and Investments, and they uh, currently uh, are looking to maybe op start operating there. And the, the story from Leicester is that we, we started working in, in Zambia at the Manali Nickel Mine. Um, through Consolidated Nickel Mines and Consolidated Mines Investment. We had a, a PhD project, which is just finished on Manali. Uh, there should be some papers coming out of that soon. Um, and one of the other projects that we started working on was this Katumba one in 2019-20 with uh, Kate Cannon, who is uh, pictured here, both in the field in Zambia and back in um, Cambridge at Zeiss's uh, facility there. Now, Katumba is a pretty complex ore body. Its geology has, so the, the blue here are the Katangan sediments. They're intruded by granites, which are then intruded by these light blue cyanides. Okay, and there are breaches in there along the fault zone. Not only that, we've got multiple stages of alteration. Again, this is classic for IOCGs. So in this case, we've got carbonate alteration, uh, iron oxide alteration, sericite alteration, K potassic uh, alteration and magnetite alteration. So lots of different alteration styles. And then the mineralization itself, we've got hypergenes. So this is classic um, pyrite, chalcopyrite type mineralization. And then the oxidized blanket on top. And then right at the top, we've got a very leached zone, which has just got iron oxides in. So I'll walk you through the rock types. The host rocks are these quartz porphyry granites um, and cyanides and also some breaches and they are variably altered. I mean, here we've got potassic alteration, hematite alteration, and you can see there are very uh, well-defined boundaries between the two different types of alteration there. Um, so there's, there's, there's two different rock types which are variably altered by three to four different alteration styles. So every bit of rock that you look at in a core can potentially look different uh, because of the function of those, those two factors. And on top of that, um, the mineralization as well. So we've got various styles of alteration, uh, which are just listed there, but main point is We've got multiple stages of alteration. One of the most important ones, though, is this carbonate alteration. And I'll come to the reason for that um, now, because if we have a look through uh, an example drill core, um, so we've got copper and gold here. And we just removed the, the scales on there just for, for just to uh, not quite highlight the, the exact grades, but we're, we're looking at up to sort of 10, 20, uh, percent copper in some of these uh, intersections um, and gold may be up to a gram per tonne. But interestingly, we have a gold zone there, which is related to iron oxide alteration. The copper zone is offset from gold. So copper and gold are not doing the same thing here. And also look at this carbonate alter. So we got iron oxide, potassium, sericity, carbonate alteration. If we put that in, where there's carbonate alteration, we do not have supergene copper. Okay, so this is quite an important control because the, the carbonate alteration, it's probably buffering that supergene process. And it means that where we've got carbonate alteration, we don't have uh, copper mineralization. But where, we, where that's absent, we've got potassium and or iron oxide, that's where we get the grains. So it's not just copper and gold, there's a, there's a few others. Silver is, is um, enriched in that blanket as well. Cobalt uh, isn't particularly. We've got some spikes in things like bismuth, tellurium, and then iron, you see, goes up 
into the leach zone where we've got 20% iron in that iron oxide zone. So uh, again, still quite complex. Maybe complex, but these rocks are beautiful, okay? So anyone who's worked on uh, copper deposits where you've got um, oxidation of those uh, uh, copper minerals at the surface will know that you get the most beautiful green and blue uh, rocks. And in fact, if you've got cuprite as well, you've got red <laughs> along with the green um, and blue. And there's appetite here as well. So this is one of the alteration stages. We've got this huge appetite crystal. Um, and when we went there, um, I was actually there on Valentine's Day in 2019. So I, I tweeted a little, a little, a little, a little, uh, a little, a little poem there for Valentine's Day, which got a reasonable amount of likes. So that is for me on Twitter at least. Okay. Uh, here are some of the uh, thin sections that Kate worked on, and you can see even the thin sections are, are, are fantastic in terms of the, the colour and the complexity of these rocks. Uh, so we've got hypergene sulphides and then supergene secondary sulphides, oxides, native copper, carbonate sulphides, and gold. So what I'm going to now go through is how we actually went about uh classifying these different styles of mineralization okay so we've, got, we've not just got hypergene and supergene within the supergene we've got lots of different types of minerals so in terms of pro potentially processing this all so the grades are great okay so you've got two percent copper nearly 30 30 million tons of two percent copper um the grades are good but what's the mineralogy like okay and how does that vary through the ore body? So that was the main sort of aim of, of Kate's project to do that. Uh, and this is where Zeiss came in. So we've been working with Zeiss for a few years now using their uh, quantitative mineralogy called uh, Mineralogic, which is a type of software which it maps your entire thin section using EDX analysis. We can define our pixel size and each of those pixels is characterized by a stoichiometry. So this pixel here, for example, gives us copper, iron, um, and sulfur. Uh, we do some corrections, um, and if it matches the known sort of thresholds, which we, we put in for chalcopyrite, it calls that chalcopyrite, okay? And it can give us quantitative data, which I know you can't see there because I'm gonna show you it. Uh, in better detail uh, later. So uh, the, the, I'm not going to spoil the surprise there. So what does the hypergene ore look like? So this is the, if you like, the primary IOCG mineralization. This is the sort of thing that is mined at a deposit like Ernest Henry um, in Queensland. Um, so these are the mineralogic maps. So these are color-coded mineral maps from that mapping on Zeiss's SEMs. Uh, so the yellow in there is pyrite and the red is chalcopyrite. So we've got a lot of chalcopyrite there, patchy, also associated with pyrite. Um, so there it is in, in backscattered electron. We've got pyrite with chalcopyrite around it, uh, chalcopyrite, and there it is with some appetite uh, in yours. We've also got these veins of iron, manganese, carbonate with chalcopyrite in. Um, as well. So that is the, if you like, the primary ore, and that's at the deepest level. Now that actually is relatively low grade, okay? It's the super gene enrichment that bumps up the grade here. But as a colleague who uh, works for Zeiss always tells me, you don't mind grade, you mind minerals, okay? So 2% of one mineralogy, 2% copper at one mineralogy, versus 2% copper of a different mineralogy may well be completely different in terms of the economics. So important thing about this project was to understand that super gene enrichment. And Kay was managed to, managed to define a number of styles based on their mineralogy um, and the textures which showed a progressive alteration. So the first thing that happens, chalcopyrite, which is in red here, 
starts to get altered around its outside by this purple stuff, which is chalcocite. So chalcocite is the first um, alteration product of chalcopyrite. Chalcocite is a copper sulfide. Chalcopyrite is copper iron sulfide. So what you're doing is you're getting rid of some of the iron and you're getting rid of some of the sulfur and you're upgrading the actual copper content by producing chalcocite. That's a good thing, okay? Chalcocite is also a sulfide. Okay, so you can process it in the same way that you would process other sulfides like chalcopyrite. The next stage is that you get the chalcocyte, which again is in purple here, but it's starting to be replaced by the pinkish uh, one here, which is cuprite. Now, cuprite is a completely different mineral. Cuprite is a copper oxide. Okay, so that's going to behave differently to whatever reagent that you are using um, to try and leach the copper uh, from these rocks. Um, so we've got cuprite in there and also native copper. Now, ironically, native copper is, is not actually um, uh, particularly amenable to processing, um, which is, you know, we're trying to get the copper out, but actually having native copper uh, isn't so isn't so great, but it does make some spectacular samples. So that next stage of supergene alteration upgrades things by converting stuff to native copper, but also uh, copper oxide. But that's not all. Supergene stage 2C is malachite replacement, and this is actually the most common style of copper mineralization in the in the supergene blanket. The mineralogic map is shown here. Everything in green here is malachite. You can see most of this uh, is malachite. There's a few little uh, pinkish blobs uh, of some other copper minerals, but it's mainly malachite, uh, which is a copper carbonate. Okay, it actually fizzes if you put a little bit of acid on it, similar to, to calcite does. So this is a copper carbonate, a hydrated copper carbonate. But that's not all. Some of the rocks have gone even further and altered even further beyond malachite. Uh, that's been replaced by brockantite, um, which is a copper sulfate uh, mineral. Okay, now that's the most advanced stage. Now, usually when we're looking at these rocks, we've either got malachite or brockantite, not both. Okay, so the, 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 the EHPH conditions are such that in any particular uh, part of the ore body, you, you've either got one or the other, not necessarily uh, both. Now, this was actually really important. Kate's work here identified brockantite for the first time because um, the previous company had, had, had logged this as pseudo malachite. So, brockantite can look quite like malachite um, in hand sample. You can get nice needle-like crystals, um, but uh, it can be a bit more amorphous. Now, malachite is a copper carbonate. You put acid on it, it fizzes, okay? So, pseudo-malachite is a copper phosphate. If you put acid on that, it doesn't fizz. So, uh, we think that the previous company had, had logged anything that looked like malachite and fizzed as malachite, and anything that looked like malachite but didn't fizz as pseudo-malachite. But actually, Kate couldn't find any copper phosphates in any of her samples, but she did find the copper sulfate brockantite. Now, if you're going to acid leach these, brockantite as a sulfate is a lot more amenable to that um, leaching process um, than than a copper phosphate. So this is actually quite a significant finding of her work. Now, not only does that mineralogy that we've been doing at Zeiss give us some nice uh, maps showing the different phases, it also gives you quantitative data on the proportion of your sample that contains different minerals, but not only that, the, pro the where the element deportment is. So this is what these pie charts are, and I'll, I'll zoom in on a couple of them in a minute, but we start with largely chalcopyrite. This is just the copper minerals, okay? Chalcopyrite in red, which then goes to chalcosite, which is purple. Then we start getting the cuprite coming in and a bit of malachite, then lots of malachite, then malachite drops down and we get brockantite, okay? 
So if I zoom in on a couple of these, this is how powerful this technique is. It allows us not only to map these mineral phases, tell us the proportions of those mineral phases, but also tell us where our metals are. So in the example on the left there, chalcosite, um, stage 2A, 86%, 87% of the copper in that rock is in chalcosite. There's 5% in mixtures, 6.7% um, in chalcopyrite, and a tiny bit in cobalt, less than a percent in cuprite. The example on the right, uh, brockantite, nearly 80% of that sample 80% of the copper in that sample is brockantite, a little bit in malachite. So what we can do is we can, we can assess different parts of the ore body in terms of their dominant mineralogy, which may be relevant to how each zone of the ore body is processed. So uh, this is a drill core where Kate's taken some samples down here in the hypergene where are pretty much 100% of the copper is in chalcopyrite. Then we've got a zone here where things are more cuprite, chalcosite, the malachite zone, and then a brockantite zone there um, as well. So it's a, a really nice way to be able to show, uh, we've got copper grade, you can see how much that increases uh, in these supergene samples compared to the hypergene. Hypergene is 1% or less copper. Um, and then we're getting up to sort of tens of percent copper uh, in some of these. So if we look at copper, iron and sulfur, so this is again using this quantitative data from the from the mapping. This top, uh, this top bar chart here has copper in green, iron in uh, brown and then sulfur in the sort of the, the pale uh, buff there. So as we go through the stages from left to right, the amount of iron in the rock decreases, the amount of sulfur sort of wavers a bit, but the amount of copper in the rock increases significantly. So it's originally about 1%, and then it ends up being up to sort of 20%, 30%. Okay. The sulfur starts off in sulfides, but then it ends up in barite or brockantite in sulfates. So the sulfur is still there, but it, it ends up in different minerals. And the iron as well starts off in sulfides, like pyrite, and then ends up um, in, in oxides. So this sort of data that we, we've been doing with Zeiss allows us to, to really understand quanti in a quantitative way changes in mineralogy across an ore body. Now, uh, I, I shouldn't really talk about IOCGs without talking about the G. So there is gold here, but as I mentioned earlier on, it's, it's sat in its own little zone and it's decoupled from the copper. We don't quite understand that yet. Um, and it's only present in these zones of intense iron oxide alteration, which appear banded. And this banding puzzled us for a little bit because um, it kind of looks like a gossam, but it's about 200 meters down, so it isn't. So we didn't know what that banding was, whether it's some sort of hydrothermal effect. It might be actually that this is a xenolith of Katangan supergroup uh, sediments. And this is actually um, uh, iron oxide altered sediments. And therefore the, the chemistry is different, which might mean that we drop out gold instead of copper. Uh, but the gold's present is little native gold uh, particles which Kate identified again in SCM and RC. And something else to look at. So yeah, we got copper, we got a little bit of gold. Have we got anything else? So there are lots of lots of other potential byproducts these days that might be of interest to uh, technology um, uh, resources, things like cobalt for uh, electric vehicle batteries, often associated with copper. And um, things like tellurium, selenium for solar panels, things like that. Um, and so this diagram shows um, uh, these elements normalized um, to an average hypergene. So it's basically telling you whether things in the supergene environment are enriched or they are depleted. And you'll notice that actually cobalt is depleted. So 
in this super gene environment, we upgrade the copper, but we actually get rid of the cobalt. Um, there's the copper increasing, of course, uh, but other things that increase is selenium, a um, little bit of arsenic maybe, um, possibly a slight increase in uh, silver, but also bismuth um, uh, enriched as well. And at the end of this study, what uh, Kate was able to do was sort of piece this together. And it's like from a from a, a geological perspective in terms of the history of the supergene process, we start with a particular um, copper iron sulfur assemblage of chalcopyrite, a little bit of pyrite. And as we progress through basically becoming more and more oxidized, the mineralogy changes. Copper is gained, sulfur and iron is lost, carbonate comes in, uh, sulfate comes in, and you change the mineralogy through this depending on really how oxidized things are. And if, if, if you want an EH-PH diagram, so this is uh, uh, pH here and EH, which is a, a measure of the, the oxidation state, um, we start somewhere down here with chalcopyrite and the fluids, or at least the evidence, if we put it onto one of these phase diagrams, the evidence from Kate's uh, mineralogical work is that we go into covalite, chalcosite, native copper and cuprite, that's that stage 2b, into malachite, which is 2c, and then into brockantite, which is stage 2d. So effectively, the pH isn't really changing. It's the oxidation state. We are getting more and more oxidized. Uh, the, chain, the switch to brockantite does show actually a slight increase in acidity. Um, but there's a nice path where which relates nicely to the, the, the actual evidence from thin sections. And so we were able to put a, together a model for this. We've got the original IOCG sulfides, chalcopyrite and pyrite. These are then oxidized, we, we are starting to oxidize, but we get chalcosite first, which is still a sulfide, but a copper sulfide rather than a, a, we lose it, a bit of iron and sulfur. So we're upgrading the copper tenor, if you like. Uh, we've got cuprite native copper as well. And then we start to get malachite uh, and brockantite um, into these um, later stages, generally towards the top. Okay, more oxidized, we've got that transition to the um, malachite and brockantite, which are the ones closer to the surface. And if you were to open pit this resource, those would be the ones that would form the first feeds to your, to your mill. So this is actually a very deep profile. We're talking sort of 500 to, to plus meters of this super gene blanket. And it's quite well um, defined laterally, um, which we think is to do with this um, uh, the control from this steep uh, fault system. Uh, we've got this leached cap, that we've actually got a hill here, this is Katumba Hill, uh, which is an iron oxide leached cap and the copper comes in just below that. Uh, so that's a, an east-west cross section. Um, Kate was able to put, put this together and, and we, we, we now have a, an understanding that within the ore body there are different uh, domains based on their dominant copper mineralogy, whether it's brockantite dominated, malachite dominated, or into the sulfides uh, at depth. So in Zambia, copper, it's not just all about the copper belt, although I would say that that dominates copper uh, in Zambia, uh, but there's an interesting little, uh, um, uh, little district of IOCG type deposits uh, just a little bit further south from the, from the, from the copper belt. Um, in the case of Katumba, deep weathering is caused super gene enrichment. And in that case, it's produced a very high grade copper deposit, but there's complex mineralogy, which of course needs to be sorted out, which is um, a study like this is able to do. Uh, we've got gold in there as well, but it seems to be uh, separated from the copper. Um, carbonate alteration seems to buffer that super gene mineralogy as well. Uh, we've got high grades um, in 
the areas which are not carbonate altered, they are altered either potassium, sericitic or iron oxide. Uh, malachite is our most common mineral. It's, and brockantite, not pseudo-malachite, uh, forms a significant zone in the most oxidized, generally upper parts. Uh, and the good news is that all of that supergene zone is amenable um, to acid leaching as a potential processing uh, technique for that. So, as the sun is uh, heading towards the horizon here in uh, North Wales over the Irish coast, Irish sea coast, here's a little picture of a, a classic sundowner uh, from Zambia, um, and I'm happy to take. Uh, any questions that you have uh, on that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, if anyone's got any questions, then please put them in the chat box or unmute yourself and um, ask away. More silence. Well, yeah, so I'll ask a question while we're at it, seeing as Dave's there. Um, Dave, do you think that the complexity of the mineralization will affect the mining process? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the things that we, we set out to try and provide some information for to, to, to feed into potential design of that, that processing. And um, the fact that it's uh, so it's a mixed ore. So we got oxidized and supergene. Um, uh, so oxidized and uh, and the hypergene ore at depth. Um, that said, the the high grades are in the supergene zone. So I think if if it's going to be exploited, it's actually going to be that supergene blanket that is going to be um, uh, that that would be mined. Uh, what we've managed to do is provide information of any potential zonation between basically copper carbonates, phosphates, and sulfides, and, and sulfates. Now, how that is, I, I'm not a minerals process engineer, so uh, I've been reliably informed that all of that um, should be amenable to acid leaching. The, particularly the identification of brockantite, the sulfate, instead of pseudomalachite, the phosphate, um, should, be, should be a lot easier to that acid leaching. Great, thanks. We've got a question. Uh, do you know of and is Shivuma mine a little further north of similar mineralization? And that's from Paul Tyler's. Oh, which mine? Uh, Shivuma. Shivuma. I, d I don't know. I don't know how far, how, how much further north is that? Paul, do you want to unmute yourself and discuss? Yeah, hi, David. Sorry about that. Uh, struggling right. to find the mute button. Um, yeah, it's perhaps... Oh, I don't know, 40, 40, 50 miles south of Solweezy. Okay. Um, so is it close to Kasempa, maybe? Because the Yeah, you've got it. That's the one. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, I, I actually don't know much about Kasempa. Um, and I'm not sure whether it is sort of more classic copper belt sediment hosted style or might be IOCG related or maybe a little bit of both. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether Zimba wants to, to say anything about that or whether that might be a... <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure on that. Um, to, be, to be honest though, even in the Mumbwa region, so the Katumba looks like it is proper IOCG related to fluids coming off of cyanide. Um, but there are other deposits which are hosted within the Katangan supergroup sediments there, which look much more like um, sediment hosted deposits, which were sort of exploited in the early, early 2000s. So, um, I mean, there's a, there's a chance that we can have hybrid styles where, you know, you're getting a fluid from the 
coming off the granite or the the cyanites but it it's interacting with other fluids that are being circulated in the basin um during that pan-african orogeny so i don't i, I don't know but it, it it could be a bit of both <laughs> uh no worries thank you all right um we've got a comment from uh amunshire sorry if i said that wrong um, great talk, David. From a mineral exploration perspective, any comments about the potential for something undiscovered that is even bigger in the Mumbawa district? Yeah, so that's, that is a good a good question. So um, uh, I think BHP did a lot of geophysics around the early 2000s, which I think was when Katumba was uh, uh, discovered. Um, interestingly, Around that area, there are a lot of hills with iron oxide uh, caps. Now, Katumba is one of them, and there is no real evidence of any copper at surface because of that leached cap. So, um, Katumba is basically a, a very high-grade copper deposit, but it's underneath uh, up to 100 meters of, of iron oxide cap, for which there isn't really a geochemical signature at the surface. So there are a lot of other iron oxide capped hills in the area, uh, whether they might also have another super gene copper deposit underneath them, uh, I think there probably is a little bit of potential there, yes. Whether it's going to be bigger than Katumba, um, I don't know, but I think there is probably some potential there for maybe a few more discoveries, yeah. Do you have any more questions? Hi Dave, is, uh, is the majority of the copper deposits um, uh, just in the mining setting or are there any um, placer, placer samples or river samples that, um, that you've got in that area of the world? Yeah, so, so actually the, the so Kat Katumba is the, the one that is nearest um, any development. Uh, there are another. There are a lot of prospects in that area. Um, some of the uh, the old mining was from Hippo, and a couple of the other ones um, was in the early two thousands. Um, so they are. There's there's no active copper mining in that district at the moment. Uh, Katumba is the one that is closest to that. Um, uh, but I don't I don't know of any plasters or anything it, it's it's iocg stuff or potentially sediment hosted stuff which has either been historically mined um a while ago or there might be some potential for now thank you uh, i i guess the, th the thing is i mean it's 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 in zambia so <laughs> for every katumba where you look at it and go oh 30 million tons at two percent uh, in a super cheap blanket you've also got like a kansanchi up the road or or something like that and um, yeah. so it, it's a very well endowed uh, copper country so um uh, yeah the, the the iocgs of the mumba district are probably just fighting for for attention from the, the, the is, there a, is there much artisanal is there much artisanal uh small scale stuff it, or is it all government not, not that i've seen not that i've seen i mean i've only been in the area a couple of times briefly um but no i've, I've not seen a, a great deal of um, uh, artisanal stuff in that area now. Thank you. So I think that might be it for questions. So I'm going to give you a virtual round of applause, Dave. Um, if we're in the office or in the in the in a room, it would be much louder. Um, thank you very much. But thank you for that really interesting talk. Um, hope thank you me. enjoyed presenting. Yeah. No. no. We've got lots of uh, claps going on and thanks. And um, so for our next talk, it's being given on the 4th of May. And that has been presented by uh, Justina Edgar from Imperial College London. It's a little bit closer to home. Um, it's going to be on the Harwich Formation of the London Basin. Um, so thank mm -hmm. you, everybody, for joining. I um, hope to see you then. And thanks again to Dave. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Holly. Pleasure, and thanks everyone, uh, and anyone who's watching the recording as well. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Instead of 